This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, brought to you by the Fur Bearers. A concrete-laden street runs the distance of Lower Hamilton, marking the transition from residential housing to commercial and industrial spaces, what many people think of when they hear Steel City. But along this busy street, something magical is happening. Swatches of concrete are vanishing, to be replaced by naturalized gardens. Flowers, native grasses, and plenty of shrubs and trees are establishing themselves in this urban core thanks to programs and the teams at Green Venture, a Hamilton-based nonprofit. Depaving is just one of the many projects that Green Venture focuses on, in addition to rain gardens, urban mini forests, volunteer and educational opportunities, and so many more. To get the rundown on the significant impact this nonprofit is making and how it could help your community, Defender Radio is joined by Green Venture Program Manager, Liz Enriquez. I thought an interesting place to start could be with a bit about Green Venture and that the origins of the group actually go back a ways when it was an umbrella group for other little environmental groups before amalgamation in the city of Hamilton. Yes, Green Venture has been around since 1994. And so it's been an established environmental not-for-profit here in Hamilton. There's a lot of projects that Green Venture has had their hands on. And it's great because you know, we know what we're doing and we have a lot of established partnerships. Yeah, that makes a big difference. And there was involvement in the introduction in the area for green carts, uh, blue bins, rain barrels and energy audits. And those are things that now Green Venture still does. um, But are I, I find today people don't question what that may be right off the bat. Now it's it's sort of a common knowledge thing. And it's cool to see that Green Venture sort of led that a little bit and is now at a point of challenging things like runoff and pavement um, and getting into new programs that are uh, maybe a little more accessible for residents as well. Uh, so why don't we talk a little bit about some of those great programs, starting with the Depave, because I think that's the one that maybe is a bit new for a lot of folks out there. Definitely. And hopefully down the line, that is also the new normal. It's like, of course, we're converting underused concrete into green space and using green infrastructure to manage runoff. Like that is an ideal goal is to really make those changes. And also for residents to maybe switch from having that lawn and adding more green infrastructure like rain gardens onto their property. But I'd love to talk about the DPAVE program because that is definitely what Green Venture has been very well known for in the last few years. So a lot of people still don't know about it, but many people have seen the transformations around Hamilton. There's around six or seven gardens on Barton Street. There's uh, a few other sites downtown and in various schools where Green Venture worked with community and volunteers to remove concrete or replace underused grass or you know dirt patches with either rain gardens, pollinator gardens, or some sort of green space. And those have been um, very well received by community because oftentimes it really is an underused piece of concrete or an underused corner of a parking lot that is not serving a lot of purpose aesthetically for one, but also because of the stormwater issues that many cities have uh, with high runoff, flooding, lots of water issues, it's important to add more green spaces where we can. And so that's really the goal of these deep paved projects. And I think it's it's interesting to see the change because it's it's one thing to be told like, oh, you see that weird bit of concrete next to this corner store. We're going to turn that into a beautiful naturalized garden. And the, the initial reaction is with concrete, uh, like it's it just doesn't make sense inherently at first. Uh, but then when you see what it looks like after and the the beautiful work of designing those spaces, too, I think that's that's valuable to point out is it's not just remove a slab of concrete and throw some seeds on the ground as these are beautifully designed and maintained naturalized Mm -hmm. spaces and you work with designers yeah we've been working with Adele Pierre who's an incredible landscape architect 
And, you know, I've learned so much from working alongside her about the design because I also thought naturalized native gardens were kind of messy. You just threw native flowers in the and the seeds and let it grow. Um, you know, that was my perception a few years ago until I started really seeing how it can be a structured garden. And I think a lot of times, too, I've been in the community and doing events and people are like, oh, I would love to do a naturalized garden or I would love to do a native plant garden, but I don't want to get fined by bylaw or I don't want my neighbors to complain that it looks too messy. And I tell them, like, you know, we have so many great examples of native plant gardens that do not look messy. They are super structured. There's a design element to it. And here is, you know, here are some examples. And so most of the deep paved projects, um, you know, I think all of them actually ha are, don't look chaotic. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that look, but if you're concerned about bylaw or your neighbors complaining, I think these are really good examples where you can have a neat garden that still offers so much variety and biodiversity yeah and there's some plants too that I, I think if folks knew were they could just put into a garden like a, a red Aussie or dogwood or um what are they northern fire i think is one of the 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 cultivar names it's a beautiful twiggy shrub with flowers that attracts all kinds of birds and squirrels love it and it it can be manicured into a tree it can be kept as just like a stand and every year the new growth comes up with this brilliant red. So all winter you get a punch of color. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a highly needed plant in, in our region of Hamilton and many other places because it's just not available elsewhere. So it it is very much, a, yeah, it's going to be naturalized, but absolutely there can still be a lot of care put into that design. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in a class I took, we even talked about um, if you let, you know, a field become pasture or meadow again, a simple thing to do to make it look a bit nicer for the public is just mow an edge around it. So not the whole thing, but just six inches to a foot, because it gives the impression that someone is maintaining it and our brains are happy by mm. that. It's a very interesting, the, the things you can do right. to make it work. Um, now, in terms of the paving, I guess there's going to be a lot of folks wondering aren't I supposed to put my water in the sewer system? Isn't that what it's there for? And I think it's a fair question of why do we have a sewer system if we're trying not to put anything in it at this point? Very fair question. And I think the other thing that people are confused about is we're trying to keep water on your property. And for so many yes. years, we've been told, get the water away from your property so it doesn't cause flooding or any kind of water issues. Now, there is a way to strategically keep water on your property without causing damage. And this is where green infrastructure comes in and rain gardens are one example. But the reason that we're trying to reduce the amount of water going into the sewers is because in Hamilton and many cities across the world, North America, we're seeing more flooding events. We're seeing um, you know, more rainfall events and the the system, the sewer system, especially in Hamilton was where I'm from and where Green Venture operates, it's outdated. It is operating at maximum capacity. And there's been so many articles in the past where water, raw sewage is going into the waterways. It's going into, it was going into Shadow Creek. It's going into the yep. bay, the harbor, the lake. So many areas are seeing raw sewage go through because the sewer system at its current state cannot keep up with all the water. And so when it can't be treated, it gets released. And this isn't a secret. This has been going on for a long time. There, you know, there have been articles, just quickly search up raw sewage Hamilton or water Shadow Creek Hamilton. All of these articles will show up. So what we're trying to do is really take some pressure off the sewer system by ha having the water stay on site in gardens, filtering through, getting cleaned, or maybe in rain barrels or some sort of water harvesting system that the water can then be released at a later time, a later date, thus taking some pressure off the sewer system. Yeah, and that's the the second or one of the benefits of the deep paving. Anywhere it happens is all of a sudden a lot of that water can actually access the ground. And when you watch a rainstorm anywhere you live, I, I encourage people, watch how the water moves because you might be surprised at how quickly it starts going once it hits concrete compared to how it's running over a lawn or 
uh, in my case, fighting the rocks I have put down on the eaves to try and slow it down so it stays on the lawn in one particular spot. Uh, the second it hits a hard surface that it can't uh, mm -hmm. uh, permeate, it just goes and it wants to find the lowest, flattest point, which in a city is the sewer system. Um, and that also has a lot of impacts I found on um, how wildlife mm -hmm. behave. It's sad to see birds trying to drink on a curb. Right. Which is definitely contaminated with oil, gasoline, who knows what else that's picking up, salt, you know, all sorts of pollutants, which is the other element to slowing it down. And that's what we say. We either say slow it down or soak it up. Because as you said, with permeable surfaces, the water is just running right off. And, you know, this is problematic in many ways, but flooding is one. Picking up all the pollutants along the way is another it's 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 not ideal and here in hamilton um it's a very clear problem but it's not unique to hamilton mm -hmm. i want to talk a bit about canopy coverage because uh in the the mission there is note of wanting to increase forest coverage so that's not just canopy but canopy is sort of part of that uh what are the various ways and and reasons that green venture wants to see that increase well you know there's no arguing that more trees are better, and it doesn't matter how you look at it. Is it the deforestation? Is it climate change? Like, there are so many reasons why we need more trees. It could be shade. It could be sound, you know, buffering in urban settings, um, reducing the heat island effect. Like, the list goes on and on and on about why we need more trees. As cities grow, um, and again, Hamilton is is not unique in this problem, but Trees disappear, grass, greenland disappears, meadows disappear because of development. And we all need a place to live, but then how do we add those trees that are getting lost or that green space that's being lost back into a city? That's one of the things that our Canopy for Community projects are trying to address and also equitable access to green space. And so Green Venture has been working at city housing properties to add more trees um, and also across schools, public areas, we work closely with the city of Hamilton. Um, and one of the projects that we've been really focusing on is the mini forests, which are a kind of a newish technique. And maybe it's not new, but it's new to Hamilton, um, where we're planting high density, very diverse plots of land with lots of trees that mimic a natural forest. So there's big trees, little trees, uh, kind of under shrub coverage. Uh, and that's that's something that Green Venture has been really working on. Yeah, the uh, mini forests are a really cool uh, concept. And I'm just looking up really quick because I interviewed someone. Uh, it was the Mini Forest Revolution was the name of the book. Um, and yeah, Milwaukee, Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee forest. forests. Mm -hmm. That's They're called it. a few yeah. things. So Milwaukee person... forest, yeah. Milwaukee inspired forest, mini forest, tiny forest, pocket forest, but all of them, you know, are pretty much the same thing. Yeah. It's a very cool idea. And I think, again, it's, it's one of those solutions that as soon as you read about it or someone explains it to you, your immediate question is, well, why aren't we doing that everywhere? Because it like it for a relatively small plot of land, you can jam a whole lot of biodiversity in there when you use this method, and then it grows and takes care of itself over time, which is I think the other kind of beautiful thing about it. And especially in urban areas, uh, and we we deal a lot with folks who feed wildlife or who are trying to get wildlife to come into their properties, and they'll put out uh, anthropocentric or human made food sources, bird seed and snacks and so on. If you want to support wildlife in your community, make one of those, because not only are you creating habitat and food, you're creating connectivity. These animals now can go from one spot to the other with greater ease. And that is a huge issue in Hamilton, where we've got a grid system that is paved. It is primarily steel along the lakeshore. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's lovely to know that that's happening locally. And I encourage folks to look that up. Um, and I also want to get into energy audit briefly, uh, cause this is, again, it's a program that I think has been around for a while and many people may have heard of, but don't necessarily know how it'll benefit them. So could you share a bit about how an energy audit will help folks and, and how green venture supports that? 
Yes. So Green Venture works with a few different contractors who are experts in different energy topics from solar panels to um, energy efficient appliances and also sealing up your home to prevent drafts. So there's a few ways you can get involved. And there's also sometimes um, different grant opportunities or different rebates that the energy audit staff can help a resident or homeowner access. So Essentially, the process is a, an energy auditor could come to your house and there's a few different tests that they do. I've actually had it done a few years ago, maybe well, close to a decade ago, actually. They seal up the house and they see, um, you know, where the leaks are coming from and offer those suggestions on how you can correct them or mitigate those effects. And then when I did it, there was a rebate program available. So, you know, they guided me and provided those resources. And so for anyone... Uh, living in a home and maybe you want to reduce your energy bill or you want to, you know, be a little bit more eco-conscious as a resident, this is a great option. Yeah, they're they're fantastic. And it can be a significant change and it can be a lot of minor changes. Uh, the, the one example I share with folks mm -hmm. is getting a little bit of inexpensive weather stripping. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm putting it around the inside of my back door and it was the draftiest door in the house and it's not completely sealed, but it slowed down a whole lot. I did one too. I, I just did like a, a window cover that, you know, you just blow mm -hmm. dry on because I had a very drafty window and I was, it was always cold and I thought, what is going on? And I put my hand up against the window and I was shocked by how cold the air was around there. And I had all my plants there. I'm like, no wonder my little yeah. plants here are not loving life. So that was a very simple solution. And you know, sometimes you don't even notice it because you can't you can't really see it. You kind of just feel it and you're like, oh, well, I don't know. But um, an expert can definitely help you see things that you might not even understand or that you might be missing. I want to talk a little bit about uh, speaking of little plants, talk a little bit about the gardening club and the community involvement, because I think. For me, this is a thing that separates Green Venture and, and full disclosure. I've come to some of the speaker things and I've, I've volunteered for some of the cleanups and whatnot. Um, but you have all of these programs, but you're also fostering community. And I, I, when I was trying to get involved in some of this, found it difficult to find a group that would welcome an individual who wasn't coming with 10 people and had a work site mm -hmm. prepared. Mm -hmm. um, so I personally really enjoyed it. But could you share a bit about how the program got developed and what you're hoping it will become? Yes, the Urban Gardening Club is an amazing program and I'm biased because I, I really have this vision for creating community to help with stewardship because we have all these green spaces in the city, but it was often difficult to maintain the green spaces and to make sure that they yeah. stayed clean and litter free and also um, weed free and pruned properly. And as a not-for-profit, we have limited capacity and we can't be everywhere all the time. So, you know, we thought, okay, how can we cultivate a community that knows about these projects and wants to help maintain them, but at their own pace? Because we found with volunteers, you know, everyone's schedule is different. Sometimes there's students and they're at school and then there's parents and they can't come on weekends and evenings. And we just, that was one of the challenges. And with volunteers, you want to be flexible. And so we really wanted to come up with a way where we could offer value. So we wanted to offer value to the community in exchange. We would like some support to maintain these green spaces. So that's really where this structure came from. And so we meet bi-weekly. We also really wanted to be accessible to the community and meet in places for them to explore the neighborhood. We do a lot of work on Barton Street, which is, you know, not an area people are flocking to at all times, but I, I love Barton Street. I have a soft spot for Barton Street. We want mm -hmm. to encourage people to visit different places in Hamilton. And also six of the gardens are on Barton Street. And so we thought, okay, we should be bringing people to where we want them to learn more about and to engage with that community. And, you know, we all benefit from exploring different places in the city, from meeting different members of our community, from seeing the different challenges that exist in our city and community. So that's why we meet down on Barton Street 
And it's been so amazing to witness the success because we launched in November, 2023. We had 70 people sign up the first month. We are only a few months in. We had a seven, 174 people sign up and every workshop is full. You know, we're at capacity. We actually had to move out of our current venue and we're going to be moving to the Hamilton Library on Barton Street because we kept maxing out our current location. And we also have had over 100 bags of garbage picked up by volunteers on their own time. So it's really making a difference. And not everyone who comes to the club is a volunteer and not everyone who volunteers comes to the club, but they are working hand in hand for that common goal. Yeah. And it's really lovely. I I personally, again, I've loved hearing from different speakers, meeting people who have a similar interest to me that otherwise I may not be able to engage with. And if you're not highly active on social media, it's hard these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I personally really enjoyed it. For folks who who have a, a nonprofit or have a community group and want to foster that same sense, they want to bring people in, both in terms of building and growing community for the betterment of the community, but also the support, you know, a, a localized mission, be it cleanups or whatever. Do you have any tips on how they could maybe look to to sort of get going in that way? I think one of the things that really helped us was our partnerships that we've made in the area. So we have a very close relationship with the Barton BIA, again, because so many of our gardens are on Barton Street. Then we established a close relationship with Pinch, which is a plant shop and bakery, which was originally our meeting spot. So we and we have a close relationship with the library because we've done a green space on their property. And so it's really about being engaged in the community, establishing those partnerships, because those partnerships are one of the reasons one, that we have meeting spaces. So that's a barrier for a lot of clubs is finding places to meet. So we were able to overcome that because our partners had the space. And two, they're cross-promoting. So every time we post something, our partners are helping us. And, you know, they're tapping into their audience, we're helping our audience, and we're all helping each other. It's mutually beneficial because we are marketing for each other. And also we're cleaning up the neighborhood where all of these businesses are. And so it really is not a one person show. And the other thing that's really working is um, kind of our, our low barrier technology. It's We are sending out calendar invites, but because we meet so frequently, we didn't want to have to do signups every time waivers every time you know we're trying to really reduce the barriers to make it easy for people to meet and all all of our events are free so we're constantly fundraising to pay for our speakers or asking our speakers to volunteer their time because again we really wanted this club to be accessible to everybody to wrap up you you've spoken a lot about barton street and for folks who don't know barton street runs east west on the northern edges of hamilton very much sort of the northern urban boundary i'd say before you hit the industrial area and it has had a reputation over time of sometimes being a bit rough there can be a, a, a localization of social services which tends to happen in cities and it has also been an area of affordable living for a long time um so it does have a reputation at times of not being the most pleasant place in the late hours, but during the day, it certainly is a beautiful area with vibrant shops and people, and it's a great place to visit. I'm curious for you, how would you express the, uh, um, not tenacity, but the the drive to to see that change and stick with it? Because anytime we want to see change in the world around us, personally, it feels extraordinarily overwhelming. There are so many moving parts and how can I, one person possibly make a difference? And I have seen myself, the difference being made now in this community and it's remarkable. So I'm curious, how do you, or how would you offer to people when you are in that struggle, the earlier parts of it, maybe when it's a lot more uphill, what is the thing that helps you or others potentially keep pushing through towards the goal? I think it's so cliche, but it's like, be the change you want to see in the world. I am not someone who can sit back and just hope that somebody else is going to make the difference. Like, No, if you want to see a difference, you need to be part of the solution. 
And hopefully, you know, that's infectious energy where one person starts something or two people start something and then a third friend joins and then you start seeing um, you start seeing changes. And then there's this collective inspiration or collective motivation. I think that's happening with the gardening club because one person going out to clean up garbage, it's like, oh, man, there's garbage here all the time. But as a collective, now we're if we're doing 100 bags a month, like that is significant. And I think people yeah. like to be part of the winning team and they want to be part of a solution. And so when they see that actual change is happening, they're a little bit more likely, I think, to want to get involved. And I don't know, I think you just have to stay optimistic. Like it is bleak sometimes to be like everything I'm doing, like there's still so many challenges, but I don't think we can give up. And I think that there's people who have that drive and they need to just continue pushing, pushing, pushing. And there's going to be no's, there's going to be challenges, but just keep moving. How can people get involved with Green Venture or, or where can they find you? Perfect. The easiest thing is to follow us on social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook, Green Venture. Find us online and join our newsletter is another way. Want to learn more about Green Ventures projects? See pictures of some remarkable transformations and get inspired? Check them out at greenventure.ca or find them on social media. I want to thank Liz for joining me and for all the work she and the team at Green Venture are doing in Hamilton. It's amazing. Are green or naturalizing projects happening in your community? Have you seen the benefits of them for wildlife yet? Let us know by commenting on this episode's post on the Fur Bears, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter channels. Links are available in your podcast player and in this week's show notes at DefenderRadio.com. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong. Stay strong.